Amen. Well, pollution. I'm going to talk about pollution this morning. It's everywhere. It's in cities, towns, and in the country. I mean, just go out in front of the church and walk along the ditch, and I can almost assure you, you will find some type of trash that has been tossed out of a moving vehicle. Uh, One year when we cleaned the ditches, you remember out in front of the church and we went up, I think a half mile this way and maybe a quarter mile that way, I don't remember. But anyway, I remember one year picking up 20, mind you, 20 of those little Jack Daniels bottles. And I was wondering, who in the world can drink 20 of these and still be out of the ditch? (laughs) Well, I know that people have been dealing with pollution since Adam and Eve walked out of the garden. And in the late part of the 19th century, our world began to have a lot of media, a lot of different types of media. And the subject of pollution has been addressed in commercials and programs and documentaries. I remember several commercials in the 70s. I bet I could start naming them and people would start nodding. But one in particular is still used today. And you get to see a little woodsy owl up here with the slogan, Give a hoot, don't pollute. Everybody knows that one. The school kids, the little kids. Your school needs some help. Give a hoot, don't pollute. That was his slogan, came out in 1971, and believe it or not, I still see it in places, and I still hear people say it. Pollution, where does it come from? Give a hoot, don't pollute. After Jesus had healed the woman and raised the 12-year-old girl from the dead, he went on to Nazareth. He was not honored there, and he moved on to multiple villages teaching. He sent his disciples out two by two to further extend the good news. And in chapter 6 of Mark, he takes a moment and he tells the story of John the Baptist beheading by King Herod. In the meantime, Jesus continues to meet the needs of the people, teaching, healing, and even feeding them. Chapter 6 ends with Jesus walking on the water and then continuing a ministry of wholeness to people in the Gadarenes. Chapter 7 begins with a debate on pollution. A debate on what's clean and what's unclean. In verses 1 through 13, we see an exchange between Jesus and the Jewish rulers from Jerusalem. Again, everything they bring up can be summed up in verse 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders? They're picking a fight with Jesus in case you don't catch that. And they choose to do it over the ritual of washing hands before eating. Now, in our day and time, we all go, well, yeah, you ought to wash your hands before you eat. And you should, but that's not why these folks were doing this ceremonial washing of the hands. What they were doing was washing off anything touched by someone who wasn't Jewish. It was a very, very racial thing. They were washing off anything that might defile the purity of a Jewish person according to the law of Moses. Jesus replies to them pretty sternly about how they themselves work really hard to get around the laws and traditions themselves. That's what all that whole section about in some of your translations it will say Corbin. What they had done was taken the law from Moses that said you got to take care of your parents, you got to honor your parents. And they had 
handwritten a, 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 a little uh, addendum to that that said, unless you give money to the church, and whatever you've given to the church, you can count that as taking care of your mom and daddy. And then they're on their own because you've given to the church. <laughs> so anyway, the... Uh, I don't have a clue. <laughs> so anyway, that's what they were doing, and Jesus points it out. You see these same groups, they're no longer asking questions to learn. They're no longer trying to get to understand what Jesus is saying. At this point in the gospel, they're beginning to ask things and do things, hoping to trap Jesus in his words so they can legally have him killed. And that brings us to our text for today. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 14. This morning I will be using the New Century Version. After Jesus called the crowd to him again, he said, Every person should listen to me and understand what I'm saying. There is nothing put into their bodies that makes them unclean. People are made unclean by the things that come out of them. Let those with ears use them and listen. When Jesus left the people and went into the house, his followers asked him about the story. And Jesus said, Do you still not understand? Surely you know that nothing that enters someone from the outside can make that person unclean. It goes right... Um, it does not go into the mind, but into the stomach. Then it goes out of the body. When Jesus said this, he meant that no longer was any food unclean for people to eat. And Jesus said, the things that come out of people are the things that make them unclean. All these evil things begin inside people, in the mind, evil thoughts, Sexual sins, stealing, murder, adultery, greed, evil actions, lying, doing sinful things, jealousy, speaking evil of others, pride, and foolish living. All these evil things come from inside, and that makes people unclean. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Verse 14. After Jesus called the crowd to him again, he said, Every person should listen to me and understand what I'm saying. There's nothing people put into their bodies that makes them unclean. People are made unclean by the things that come out of them. Let those with ears use them and listen. The first thing Jesus does is call the crowd to himself. Now, I love that because Jesus was always above board with his teaching. And what he's doing here is um, freeing the people from the minutia of rules and rituals that designate who is in with God and who is out with God. He speaks to the crowd. Now you realize that in that crowd would have been his disciples. And in that crowd, more than likely, are still the Jewish leadership. And Jesus says, pay attention, this is important. And in that moment, Jesus tells them something that is contrary to everything they have been taught by their parents, everything they've been taught by their grandparents, and everything they've been taught by their church. I think we sometimes don't realize how radical Jesus' teaching was for these folks. He makes them aware of where real pollution comes from. He tells them it is not what you eat or what rituals you use before you eat that piles up garbage. It is what comes out of you. Pollution comes from the heart, the mind, the attitude. It comes from inside of us. Now Jesus, as he often does when he teaches a lesson, he doesn't interpret it and he doesn't really stick around for a Q&A because he wants the people to ponder what he is saying. 
he is an incredibly wise teacher. When you present a new concept, you've got to let people think about it. He does it all the time. We see it all the time in the Gospels. So they head back to the house, and as they head back to the house, I think Jesus would have said to them, pollution, where does it come from? Give a hoot, don't pollute. Verse 17 then says, when Jesus left the people and went into the house, his followers asked him about this story. Well, I guess so. It went against everything they had been taught their entire lives. It went against everything they had been doing to stay pure their whole existence. So I thought, maybe we better park here for a minute. Because I, I think sometimes we tend to write off this kind of stuff as, well, that was back in Jesus' day and we don't even have to think about it now. I think that can get us into trouble. I think we can miss some pretty searching questions in our own hearts if we do that. Why was it so hard for the disciples to understand what Jesus was implying? Things that we've been taught since we were children, things that we have been taught culturally can be hard to give up even if they're incorrect. And the first thing most of us do go, well, I don't believe anything that's incorrect. If you think that, you're already in trouble. For the Jewish people of Jesus' day, the Old Testament was all they had. It was the law. It gave them purpose as families. It gave them purpose as people. It gave them their nationality. Leviticus, the third book of the Old Testament, and by the way, for those of you who have insomnia, if you need help at night, just read Leviticus. There are some good things in there, but there's also some really sleepy stuff in there. Leviticus, the third book of the Old Testament, is really specific about food restrictions. It's really specific about this ritual washing they were supposed to do. And in ancient times, there were really good reasons why God wanted his people to follow those. But when Jesus came... It was time for those regulations to be reassessed and reinterpreted. That's what Jesus did. It's what he does all the time. It's what the Gospels teach us. And I'm telling you right now, change makes people uncomfortable. Change makes people uncomfortable. New ideas make people uncomfortable. And yet, Jesus did it all the time. So maybe we should be thinking about some new ideas. Am I going to give them to you? No, that's for you and the Holy Spirit. But if you have questions, you can always come talk to me. <laughs> Worldview change is what Jesus brought when he came. It's what Jesus taught. And it made people so uncomfortable that they murdered him for it. Worldview changes is hard. Back to pollution. In Massachusetts, in the early 1800s, here's a great example. The Concord River flowed through the city of Lowell. Any of you been in the Northeast? That's one area I haven't got to explore much. But in this beautiful city, there were textile mills, new ones, and they were pumping out cloth. I mean, wagons were moving west, and they needed canvas, and they needed all kinds of stuff, and the United States was prospering and growing, and there were tanneries along that river, and 
There were homes, lots of people lived there. There were all kinds of other industry on the banks of the Concord. And the science of the day, the science of the day said that running water cleans itself. If the water's moving, it cleans itself. That was the science. That was what was taught in schools. That was taught, and remember, this is a time when doctors didn't think it was even important to wash their hands before they did surgery. Well, because every, the science, the culture, the people all believed that water, running water cleaned itself. They poured all of the sewer all of the refuse, everything into the Concord River. It wasn't long before that river was a mass of sludge. It reeked with foul odor and was completely <coughs> unusable and undrinkable. They couldn't even use it. So science began and the people began to reinterpret the belief that running water cleaned itself. And as science progressed, it was discovered that it took a lot more than just flowing water to be clean. That's only one element for water to be clean. Now here's what's interesting. Even after science proved that, and even after it was documented, it was almost 60 years later before changes were made. Because people, Grandma said, Daddy said, my school teacher said that running water cleans itself so it does. Sixty years later, finally changes were made, and thankfully today, the Concord River is clean, and instead of stink and sludge and foul water, it is used and enjoyed by thousands. Changing of minds and beliefs are sometimes really hard, and for these disciples, and especially for the teachers of the law, it was really hard to believe what Jesus was saying. Sometimes it's really hard to believe what Jesus is saying. I mean, it's a whole lot easier to walk over to a jug and have somebody pour a jug of water on my hands than to absolutely reject sin. That's a whole lot easier. My goodness, let me do that and go to heaven. Praise the Lord. It's a lot harder to start messing with the pollution that's in me. No wonder they didn't want to change anything. If I just wash my hands, if I just go make that sacrifice, if I just go do that, then I don't have to change me. Verse 18, Jesus said, Do you still not understand? Surely you know that nothing that enters someone from the outside can make that person unclean. It goes into the mind. It does not go into the mind, but into the stomach. And then it goes out the body. Some of you with newer versions have something very different from that. I purposely picked this one because it was clean. When Jesus said this, he meant that no longer was any food unclean for people to eat. And Jesus said the things that come out of people are the things that make them unclean. These, all these evil things begin inside people in the mind. Evil thoughts and sexual sins and stealing and murder and adultery and greed and evil actions and lying and doing sinful things. Jealousy, speaking evil of others, pride, and foolish living. All these things come from inside. 
and make a person clean, unclean. Verse 21 again, all these evil things begin inside people. The pollution of sin comes from inside of us. Now we love blaming the devil. As a matter of fact, I remember very clearly in 1969, I had a pair of big, bod big bell bottom pants with stripes and on the back was this big patch that said the devil made me do it. Anybody remember that saying? Who was that? Who did that? Who? Flip, Flip Wilson. That was it. We love blaming the devil. And the devil is instrumental in working to entice people to sin. And we are born with a sin nature. But brothers and sisters, ultimately, all actions of sin are committed because it began inside of us. We fed it with our mind. We thought about it. Or we put thoughts about it to the side and then just did it anyway. The pollution begins with those evil thoughts and selfish desires and putting ourselves in the place of God. I'll be God and make decisions for my own self. Those thoughts and desires and pride get repeated over and over and over in our heads. And then they tend to become actions. Believe me, when I get mad at Jay and I want to tell him something, I rehearse it in my head first. Now, anybody else do, do that? We need to get real and understand that this sinful thinking really can become sin. And Jesus lists some here, and you know what? I could go over each one and explain each one and what the Greek says, but I don't think that's the point of what Jesus is trying to say here. It's not the list. Hence, you thought it was about the list. We are technically holiness people, and we love lists. We love lists of sins. If we don't do that list of sins, we're good to go. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If I had my little, if I could play Salvation Army song, I'd do it. Oh, no, that's not Jesus' point. The passage in this passage, he's not giving us rules to follow. He's attempting to help his disciples. He's attempting to help us. Realize that our minds must be and can only be purified by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that purification begins with confession and repentance and acceptance of Jesus' words. And Jesus, the purification continues with the maturing of each of us as we walk with Jesus. And the purification is given strength through the action of surrendering absolutely everything to God and asking Him to cleanse us. Then the maturation in purification continues, 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 continues. Sorry, Jay. He told me, you take that necklace off. You see, what the Holy Spirit does in us, because we come to Him and we give ourselves to Him to transform us. And, and what He does is like a massive cleanup program for a fouled up river or a mile high dump. Jesus' point is to help all of us realize we cannot blame our sins on outside influences. That's the point. And we do it all the time, even if we don't like to admit it. When we commit sin, it comes from inside of us. Pollution that needs to be cleaned up. We must depend on Christ's salvation work. And we do that by looking at his life. How did Jesus live? 
What did Jesus say? What does Jesus teach? Who are we to be in Jesus? Hence, we Christians need times like Lent. Now, I'm not talking about what comes out of your navel or the dryer. We need times like Lent because it gives us opportunity where we examine ourselves. We examine our motives. We examine our words. We need days. Sometimes we need weeks. Sometimes we need months to evaluate our thoughts and intentionally talk to God about what to do about it. You see, I can't renew my own heart. Only Christ and his love can do that. Jesus called the disciples to spend time with him so they could learn you realize Jesus is still calling his disciples to spend time with him so we can learn. That, that might be one of the biggest drawbacks of letting the Holy Spirit examine us is we don't take the time to do it. I'm just too busy. I know that we get busy, and I know. I just confessed to Jan Means and Glenda Folk yesterday a little bit about my life, and the Holy Spirit went, you're just too busy. Quit whining about it and talk to me about it. So I'm there. You see, this side of the cross, we are so blessed because Jesus has procured our forgiveness. He has procured, gotten, procured this purification. We don't, we don't like that word because it's an old word, and, but it, it really can happen in us. It can happen because Jesus made it possible. When we become followers, he begins that purification process. Doing or not doing something is not what purifies us. Only the Spirit removing that pollution, just like they had to bring in all kinds of cranes, people had to work long and hard. It was a long, difficult, expensive process to clean up the Concord River. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, it will be a long, expensive, grueling process for the Holy Spirit to clean us out. Or we could just continue to go to the pitcher of water and pour it over our hands and go, I'm good to go. I don't think Jesus taught that. And I think he drives it home in this text. The church in all her beauty has given us some ways to address the pollution problem. And I believe letting the Holy Spirit examine us is one of the best. It's an ancient practice, actually. It's called eczemon. And it simply means at the end of the day we go, Lord, what did I do that pleased you? Lord, what did I do that didn't please you? And, and if it, there's anything in that column, we go, okay, so how can it be different tomorrow? Forgive me, how can it be different tomorrow? That's a practice that the church has been using for years and years and years. I'll be in trouble when I get home. So, brothers and sisters, during this time, during this opportunity, during these next six weeks, maybe it would pay off just to reassess who we are in Christ. Maybe it would even pay off to really reassess who Christ is. It may be that we're spot on 
It may be that we're spot on and the Holy Spirit says, you are spot on. Thank you. Just keep doing what you're doing. Or it may be the Holy Spirit says to us, okay, Nancy, uh, quit using the excuse of being too busy. No matter what it takes, spend time with me. Or whatever it is that he speaks to you about. From time to time, it is good that we evaluate ourselves. We do it at work. People do it at school. People do it if you go to a counselor for any kind of illness or uh, that counselor is going to have you reassessing things. Sometimes I wonder if that's why people don't go. Because they might have to reassess themselves. But I think Jesus is teaching them here that it's a good thing. And it may be a time for reinterpretation of some things. It's always good. It is wise if we take time to let the Holy Spirit be our counselor. Hmm, I think I read that in the scripture somewhere. That that's the purpose, one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is to help us assess ourselves and to help us know which way to go. The Holy Spirit speaks through us through the scripture. The Holy Spirit speaks through us through lots of practices. There are many, many spiritual practices out there that can help us put filters on all the trash, the garbage that comes in. We get it every day. One of the purposes of this season of the church is to let the Holy Spirit start shoveling some of that pollution out of us. And Lent gives us the opportunity for that. I hope you will take advantage of it so that when we get to Easter, we come into Easter renewed, restored, revived, and reinvigorated. Wouldn't you like to come on Sunday morning and be energetic? Would that not be a change? I just kept thinking about those words of that little funny looking owl. And could it be that sometimes we don't give a hoot because it's so much easier just to pour the water over our hands and say, I'm good to go. But I believe it's time to deal with the pollution. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, 